Hi there, I'm John Shields, and welcome to another episode of our Farm and Bay to Table. Um, actually, this is the last episode of season one um, for our, uh, our ex you know, celebration of everything food in Maryland. And we thought it was fitting to bring this thing to a crescendo for season one with a Maryland seafood extravaganza. And we are going to have some amazing seafood for you today. So get out your pads, your pencils, and make notes. Uh, and uh, then we can tell some stories. And we got some great people here to help tell stories. Um, we're going to have Jack Brooks with us um, later. And that's kind of a seafood royalty in Maryland coming down to see us and tell us everything about crabs and so forth and so on. And we're going to be talking about the legendary Chesapeake oyster. One time, oyster was king in the Chesapeake. There were oyster reefs that were so huge out of the water, the boats had to circumnavigate that. And we'll also learn about how important oysters are to the health of the bay. And then we get to the scary part. There are some invasive species in the Chesapeake lurking around, and we're going to do a little investigation and find out what's what, who's who, and maybe we can even find out a little bit about the blue catfish, which is the biggest invasive um, in, in the bay right now. But we're going to wrestle that thing and turn it into a caddy. So, um, so get ready for it all. But, you know, I can't do this by myself. You know, I do have an executive sous chef that helps me with this entire thing and her name is mary hassler she also has a side job that she's the ceo of harford county public library but her real job is executive sous chef here um, on our show so i would like to introduce right now mary hassler mary come on in here let's get back in the oh, kitchen I'm so excited to be here how are you sweetie good oh. it's, it's been a while since we were cooking i agree and seafood i mean maryland seafood yeah i mean that's just so near and dear to my heart and to everybody's heart i think exactly with seafood eat food any kind of thing like that. So we got, uh, our, we got our Maryland oh, so thing can, there. So when we get hot, we can go like this? Yeah, okay. yeah, See? yeah. I like it. Yeah, and so actually one of the neat thing on the, this fan, on the back of it, it shows the, the availability of seafood in the state wow. throughout the year. And so you can find that on Maryland's Best Seafood um, and find, find it all out. So you can be buying the seafood all year round. When it's at its Best and freshest. Indeed. Oh, indeed. I, I love it. Right out of the bay. Um, so anyway, we have all, as you can look at this, we have stuff everywhere. We have beautiful crabs. We have oysters. We have, we got it all. I love it. This is like my favorite day. I know. We've, we've been looking forward to yes, this for have. a while, have we, we have. not? We really have. And look at those beautiful peppers you have, too. Yeah. Ooh. Farmer's market. Farmer's market. Yeah. Across the state. Uh -huh. You can find them. Everywhere. And there's even winter markets coming, too. They are. <gasps> yes. I just read an article today in the Baltimore Sun that there's a new organization that will bring farmer's market to your home. Really? You can go on their website. that shows you what's coming from what farmer's market and they can deliver. So you know how I'm always telling you, get ye to a farmer's market. Well, it's looking like the farmer's market might just come to you. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure I that out. I'm going to have to try that. that. That's amazing. Yeah. I would love that. That's a pretty cool thing, isn't Very it? Very cool. So anyway, when you and I were plotting this, I said, <laughs> well, we have to find an expert, you know, the expert on, on food and seafood and Maryland seafood in particular. So we're going to take a, uh, a little look. Uh, um, uh, Steve? took a trip down there and visited with uh, J.M. Clayton's in Cambridge, Maryland. I think they're the oldest one in the world, aren't they? <laughs> well, we, maybe not, not in the maybe world, not. <laughs> but the damn oh, close. I, I'll go for the world. Yeah, okay. for the world. I like that. <laughs> so let's take a look and, and okay. for a visit. Gee, I've been doing this probably 50 years and uh, all my life. And uh, people ask me, you know, what's the best crab cake recipe? I said, well, it starts with the main ingredient, and that's crab meat. So stuff that's swimming today will be steamed today or tonight and be picked tomorrow. 
and uh, you know, sold tomorrow. So it's pretty hard to beat that kind of freshness. Make sure to look for that Maryland cup of crab meat. Uh, or ask your server is where the crab came from in that crab cake. There are a lot of crabs out there, a lot of crab meat, but there's only one Maryland crab, one Maryland crab cake. Well, that's pretty cool, huh? Very cool. All right. Well, without further ado, we would like to welcome Jack Brooks right down here. Well, thank Come you. On thank in. you, Mary. Hey. Thank you, John. Nice it's to good, see you. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thank good you for having you. me, Mary. Thank you so much. Thanks for driving all the way up to Baltimore. To well, this is a great drive. It's beautiful up here. It nice is. time of year, and uh, this it, is this been looking forward to it. Well, good. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that you're here. So, you're with. J.M. Clayton. Tell us a little bit about J.M. Clayton. Well, J.M. Clayton Company, my great-grandfather started in 1890 in Hoopersville, Maryland, which is one of the three Hoopers Island uh, Islands in South Dorchester. And in 1921, he moved it to Cambridge because the rail service was better, uh, phone service was more reliable, and, um, uh, well, there was no rail service on Hoopers Island at that point. There never was, I guess. And then steamboat service. So it's all the reasons to move uh, back in 21 to Cambridge to the location we are now. Wow, that's wild. Right. And you're still there. And we're still there. <laughs> Everything's old around there, including me, but we, we all still have a good time and, and try to make it work. So uh, yeah. in spite of a lot of challenges, but, you know, hey, it's, it's part, of, part, of, part of what we do. That's part of life, isn't it? It is. We it, have absolutely. challenges. They throw us challenges every, every year. Uh, and we it wouldn't be any fun without it. It wouldn't be. No. It'd get boring. That's get exactly boring. right. Exactly right, John. So we're still in great season for crabs. Um, I, I've always usually go have my crab feast later in the year. I like it in September, the beginning of October, because those crabs seem to be nice and heavy and happy. They're happy crabs. This is the best time of year for crabs. They're building up the fat, the mustard in the crab that makes our crab so sweet. It's so unique and, and re with, with regard to crabs elsewhere, uh, down the coast, uh, over in Asia or South America, or wherever. We've got this mustard that grows that that goes in these crabs and it just gives it all that sweet flavor i mean every year we go to the boston seafood show and there's seafood there from all over the world and we it's in march it's uh it's around uh, <clears throat> uh saint patrick's day yeah and so we march we don't have any fresh crab meat we just put some pasteurized or frozen little cups and people come by and they taste it and they say what do you got in this stuff and we say <laughs> you know well it's just crab and and they and we they need, they say hey, no it doesn't, you got something in here it doesn't taste like anything else at the show we say well it's it's real Maryland's crab so we do have a special thing that's inherent to the bay inherent to these crabs and we can't help it it's there and uh, it's a gift yeah it is a gift and I always say we have the best crabs I think in the world we do yeah, I we do. do amen all right so Jackie brought some crabs right on up here okay so this is a part that we call crab 101 because. Most of you that are watching today, I'm sure, are from here, but there's probably a 25, 30%, <clears throat> maybe not so much, or they just moved here. And they say, well, what the hotel bill are these things, these spottery <laughs> looking things, like I'm a scared of you, um, that, that we have here and that we get all excited about. So we have the, obviously we have the steam crab, right? Right. So... That's something that we do a little bit different than some other places. We steam our crabs. Well, that's exactly good point, John. Uh, some areas, some, some places, uh, regions boil, and a lot of them do. And we find when you boil crabs, you, you add a lot of water. So you get more crab meat out of a bushel of crabs with that, but, but it's water. And, you know, particularly want a lot of water in your crab, and people don't like paying for a lot of just water. So, yeah. and, and it boils away a lot of the flavor. That's so. what I think. I think when you boil the crab, you lose a lot of the flavor. Oh, so yeah. I really think, you know, steaming it is, is way good. We prefer it. Yeah, I no, like it. I like it too. No question about it. No question about it. All right. So, um, so the, uh, you have different watermen are coming in, they're uh, bringing the crabs <laughs> into you, and then, uh, you get these little, these boys all steamed up. Yeah, the watermen, they, they sort them on the boat by size, by sex, and by weight. And the, and the bigger premium crab, something like that one, would go to Baltimore. It would go right. to Ocean City or somewhere to be sold in a table trade. Yeah. But the crabs that are not big enough or the wrong sex or not heavy enough, uh, they go to us. And we that's where we process them. We steam, we chill, we refrigerate, and then we, we actually pick the crabs cold when we pick it for the crab meat because... Um, we, we, 
it's a food safety thing. And it's a quality thing that you want to start with something cold, keep it cold, and it stays fresher, shelf life longer, and, and all that stuff. So Absolutely. So these guys have been steamed are a lot friendlier when they're orange when, than when they're green, <laughs> green, green and blue, believe me. It, it can be scary. I got yeah. memories as a yeah. kid where they get loose in a bushel it, basket out in the backyard and you're running around like a bat out of hell because uh, <laughs> you're afraid that they're going to get you. I did worry when he brought his tub in this morning. I'm like, are they alive? Oh, my God. Oh, no, it's okay. Well, they're calm, they're calm down. All right. So people, obviously, they go out and eat steamed crabs. They right. love that. And we, we do it. We drink beer. We tell stories. We eat steamed crabs. But most people go out on a regular basis and they're getting crab meat, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're usually getting a, a pound of crab meat and <clears throat> to make whatever they want to do, their recipe. But how do we get that from there to there? Okay. Well, um, it's... Picking a crab is a lot like people's crab cake recipe in that everybody's got their own way. They've got their own recipe, their own style of doing it. The way we do it and the way we've done it for generations is basically, well, we have starts with a knife. And this curved knife, that uh, Carver Hall used to make them in Chrisfield, but they've been out of business for some time. But we, we, we source these. And uh, these are the knives of choice. They're not extra sharp. But uh, basically, you, you start and you pull the back shell off, hold your thumb on the uh, on the uh, back fin knuckle there, and pull the back shell off. And there's that mustard we were talking about. Now oh, that's that's all that, that's mustard. all that natural sweet flavor that mm -hmm. uh, people can't get enough of. So the way I do it, I like to break the mouth off, break the claws off, and then take and cut the knuckles like this. And if I were doing this in the picking room, I'd be fired because I'm slow. <laughs> I pick way too much shell in my crab meat, and I probably eat too much of it. So, so they would fire me. But anyway, so you take the knuckles off like this, and then get the gills off, or some people call them dead men's fingers. And yeah. then the, that that the fat, the viscera of the crab, you you get that out. So the most important the most important cut is coming up here in these two black lines. You want to, you, you're going to get out of a bushel of crabs, you get about four pounds of crab meat and three pounds are the smaller pieces and you get one pound of the jumbo lump. So if you make the cuts just right, if I get lucky, we'll get two pieces of jumbo out of this one crab. So you cut it right down on that black line and both sides. Wow, I didn't realize. That. And then if you get right, you well, I'm not doing like I say. I'll be fired. There, be that fire. that that was a pound of jumbo lump. You can practice them. Okay. Uh -huh. wow. And then then you get the smaller pieces here. Okay. Uh, again, I'm not doing a very efficient job, but you all get the idea. And then you, you take the tops, and uh, there's some meat in those tops. So you got to cut that membrane out, and then get the get the meat out of the tops, too. So as they're picking this out, are they grading it as they do? So they have a, a container that they're putting in jumbo lump, lump. Absolutely. We have two basic grades and we do have claw too, but the lump is the smaller pieces, the body meat that you saw, saw we picked out and now the tops. And then you get, as I mentioned, you get two pounds or two pieces of jumbo lump out of each crab. So yeah, they're separated on the table and in cups. Uh, sometimes we're picking it in cans to pasteurize for the winter inventory. The, the claw crackers use a little different knife. It's a little heavier and it's a bolder blade and it's uh, for striking the claw. And typically, see if I can get this. When they do it, and they make it look easy too, they, they, they one strike and they pull it all off. And so let's see. Now, again, I'd be fired if I were working in the picking room today. But, <laughs> But uh, we pull the claw meat out, and the claw's darker, sweeter, a little drier, but uh, a lot of people like to mix it in their crab cake recipe. Yeah, absolutely. I'm told. I, yeah, I love mm -hmm. it. And then crab soup, and then there's a there's some more in here, typically, that try to get out. Yep. yep. And uh, again, these folks go in here, and they, they make it look easy. And I'm not doing a very good job, but you get the idea. But that's how it's done. So it starts here, and then to fill one of these up, again, it takes a bushel of crabs to fill four, and uh, which well, isn't a lot of effort that goes into getting a pound of crab meat. It sure does. So, uh, so yeah, and most people don't realize that. Yeah. Well, that so is. then you take the crab meat, and people like you make, make your magic. I exactly. Mean, right. Yeah. Exactly. I, I love it. And Yeah, and so after ladies down there do all that work, and then the crab meat 
you know, gets distributed all over the region. Right. Then you come up with your recipes. You know, what what am I going to make with it? And obviously, the the thing that most people know around the Chesapeake is crab cakes. Right. I mean, everybody's got your crab cake recipe. Every family, actually, I think we we have the the Clayton recipe as well. That that often we do at Gertrude's. Uh, you know, just to give different tastes um, of of around the bay. And you know, when I've gone around and done research and everything about crab cakes, it's a dangerous job. Because when you go around, every family has the absolute best recipe. And don't you forget it. It is the best <laughs> recipe. That's and right. that's so true. I was so totally true. Agree with that. So it is a dangerous, you know, it's a diplomatic kind of thing that you have to do. But I always find for most crab cake recipes, and especially crab cake recipes, as long as you're using a good product, as long as you're using a good product and you don't overproduce and you really let the crab shine through, you're going to have a great product. It'll just maybe have a little bit of different flavor of this or that, but you're going to have a good crab cake. Right. You got to so, have the right main ingredient. That's yeah, for sure. Exactly. So that's, that's, that's very, very helpful. All right. So we're going to, we're going to send this off um, and we'll, we'll be, we'll be uh, noshing on that in just a few minutes. All right. So we're talking about, crab cakes and everybody's got that recipe. So I thought, let's do something different. Um, you know, this is kind of like the high class crab cake. Um, when, when I was young, and especially when we go out to dinner, you would get the imperial crab. And it's, I'm not, it's oh my God, that sounds so high class. What is that? And um, so I, I, I have a number of recipes and there are different versions of it, but this is one that I find is pretty typical of the Western Shore and around Baltimore and some of the old fancy res restaurants around there. So um, what we're going to do, I just took a little bit of butter and um, melted that. And I'm going to take uh, some red bell pepper that's diced up. Now with this, in the olden days, all you ever had in it really was green bell pepper. But now that we have Food Network and we have all these different things <laughs> that we watch and we're streaming and we don't know what the hotel bill is going on, you could um, you could use yellow bell pepper in there because obviously when you do it, it's really going to make it kind of look pretty. And, uh, you know, this is does have something to do with visuals. Cooking has something to do with visuals. Let me uh, just turn this up a little bit here and we'll get that sauteing. Okay, so... We have our bell peppers. We got the red. We got the green. If you want to put in some yellow, you can do that too. Orange peppers. I love the orange, orange peppers. peppers are so beautiful. Pretty. And you know the interesting thing is that they are they really are different. They are, and, mm -hmm. and they do have some, um, you know, different flavors. Very subtle differences. Yeah. Yes. I didn't realize beautiful. that. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So that's fun. And then just some mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Just kind of diced up mushrooms Can't there. Can't go wrong with mushrooms. No. Peppers. Looking yeah. good. So, Jack, I have a question for you. Sure. You were picking the crabs. Mm -hmm. uh, how long, your professional team who does this every day, how fast do they pick one crab? That's a good question. You know, uh, typically a person uh, working will pick uh, uh, in a day, pick about 20 pounds of crab meat. Whoa. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, they're, they're quick. They're very good at what they do. They can go too fast, and they get too fast. Then they don't get the, the jumbo lump out lumpy and, and they might get too much shell and stuff in there like that. But so in terms of bushels, five, seven, nine bushels, some of them can, the crab, the bigger the crabs get, the more they bushels they can sure. pick because not as many in a basket. Oh. So, uh, you know, uh, 10 bushels, 10 bushels of crabs a day per person. Wow. So they're really, they're flying. They're That's flying. a lot. That is a lot. How long does it take for somebody to get that professionally good at doing that? Um, is it like different a people. It's <laughs> different. Uh, some people are just so much quicker. Um, and, but, you know, uh, two, three months, they're pretty well. They're, 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 uh, okay. they're, they're doing what they do. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So, by the way, every everybody, uh, we, every container of crab meat we pick, and I think most companies do that here in Maryland, they put the, Initials are the number of actually the person who picks it on the bottom. So oh, we, we identify wow. exactly uh, who picked that pound of crab. Oh. Well, that's pretty so cool. yeah, yeah, so, we, pretty cool. so you can all send thank you notes. Yeah, and you, then just put the number on, and the person who actually picked your uh -huh. meat will get the thank you. Actually, we we have one retail customer that uh, asked us, and they they paid an upcharge because it costs a lot of money. That we have little stickers with the people's 
face. Oh. Uh, and and then the year they started with us, and we'd stick them on the bottom of the container, and that uh, people love it. That's people love it. And, then, and like we did start getting a lot of uh, communication back. You know, yeah. please tell. Uh, Mary, how how wonderful her crab was, and so that's yeah, that, that, was, that's that was awesome. Fun. That was fun. That. Well, that's a yeah. nice that's a nice part about local cooking. Mm -hmm. um, like when I, we talk about going to the farmers market and m meeting the people that have grown your food, um, it's nice when you go to the farmers market and you meet some watermen. You know, people that are actually fishing for the things, and so that's a, an amazing thing too that there's that connection. Because people make this happen. Exactly. They really do. Exactly. Exactly. And, and it's such an important thing because, you know, as we say, anybody that, you know, is working with you or working with different people down in Cambridge, you know, by making that choice to do that, they're kind of, you know, partnering with you. Oh, absolutely. And it keeps the money. In the community, absolutely. So it's it, it's it's not such it, a bad thing. It feeds it? on itself. Exactly. It does. It, exactly. It certainly does. So all right. So let's put some. So when we're talking about this imperial kind of thing here, this does have a little bit more flavor than some of the things, and a little bit more texture than a regular crab cake would have. One of the things it doesn't have, there is no binding in it. So there's no cracker crumbs. There's no bread crumbs or cube breads. It's all crab. So um, it does usually use a little bit more mayonnaise than like a crab cake. You like a crab cake. I generally don't like to have much more than about two heaping tablespoons per pound um, for, for that. But this we have a little bit more. So I just put in some Dijon mustard. I'm going to put in um, some ground black pepper and then Worcestershire sauce. And as you know, that there's Worcestershire in so many Chesapeake recipes. It's unbelievable. There are. Um, there are. Well, I guess it, you know, it, it's an old English um, condiment. And, you know, there were a lot of English on the Eastern Shore in the olden days. And so as that. So we're going to put just a couple dashes of Tabasco in there. Okay. And as always. Looking I'll, good. I like to put a little bit of Old Bay in just to give it. Just to give a little bit of flavor there. And then let's see what else we have here. We got the Tabasco. And I'm just going to stir all this around. Also have some capers. Capers are really nice. They're a little salty. They have a little bite to them. But it works really nicely in, in Imperial. So that's pretty much it. This is not rocket science to do this. Most most Chesapeake recipes are not rocket science. But you, you know? make it look easy, yeah, John. Yeah, you yeah. really do. I mean, that's, and you, you do, your food at, at, at Gertrude's is just so wonderful. My wife and I have enjoyed lunch there several times. Oh, that's awesome. It Thank is. You. It's an awesome place. Thank you. All right. So we have that there, right? Mm -hmm. And then we're going to take all this delicious bell peppers and mushroom and butter oh boy it's I not it's not the diet workshop <laughs> thing here but, i avoid those but this is this is quite uh quite tasty mm -hmm. looks, good. So, we're gonna, looks good so we're gonna mix all this up here and then we're gonna take the star of the show which would be the crab meat okay yeah so we're using lump, the lump crab meat today and uh i usually just gently as we've talked about, if you've been paying attention to these classes and we talk about anything, whenever we're working with crab meat, we treat it gently. Because these people spend so much time picking this stuff. They do. They work hard at it. I don't ever want to see a big old spoon or a whisk going into this thing <laughs> because, you know, you got to love your lumps uh, and you pay for your lumps. So, Absolutely. It's pampering your crab meat. Pampering your crab meat. How about that? You do. Well, you you've done this before. I have I have I had tell. a I have had a couple a couple, <laughs> a couple of times a couple of times of go rounds in this. And don't forget, you all have recipes, so you'll be able to follow along. And if you notice, John's following the recipe too. So. Oh, you put the recipes up too? We do. Yeah. Oh we my recipes. gosh! Get the recipes. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So well, we'll enjoy these these programs when we get uh, when we yeah, start yeah. watching. Yeah. Yeah. We try to we try to make it. Easy for people, you know, get the recipes up because the thing we want, we want people to cook at home. Sure. We really, really do. I mean, I, I think it's such an important act just to 
to cook something at home for your family, for your friends. And, and obviously to be able to use local ingredients is a plus, 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 plus thing. Now we're stirring cool. very gently on here. It's more of very a... Very gently. It's a fold. Folding. It we're is a fold. Folding. It was just so you wouldn't want to bring a mixer or anything? Yeah, in no, 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 no mix no, masters. No, no, no. Keep those out of there. So usually, like when I'm making a crab cake, I just do it all with my hands. I don't. Well, I'm enjoying this because anything really, I know how to cook or crabs, and sometimes I don't do that so well. But I'm, I'm enjoying watching this. You can do this. Being here, you can do this. Definitely do this, Jack. Well, you like me? All right. Me a cap. So here we have the mix here for a crab imperial. So what to do with it? There's all kinds of things we could do. We could put it into a casserole loaf and bake that. Um, we could do like they did in the old days. Jack has like these here and you could just take off the, um, you know, you just take off the the top, right? Yeah, take off the back shell. Like that. Right. And if we um, clean it out, get that thing all cleaned out, um, sometimes in, in, in the old days, what we do, my grandmother would do, she put a pot of, of water on and she put a little baking soda in it. And she would just quickly, after she scraped everything out of here, um, you know, boil the shells. How about that? And, uh, well, back, back, uh, my father told me that, uh, routinely back before the EPA and things like that, nobody knew, uh, they would. They had floats, wooden floats, uh, uh -huh. suspended out in the river, and they would take, uh, you know, barrels of these back shells and put them out in the floats, and let the minnows go in there, and they they would go in there and clean those things out just as nice as you'd ever see. Uh huh. And a couple of days, they go out, take some new ones, and bring in the clean ones, and uh, and then they dry them up and ship them up north. I think. Yeah, you could, and yeah. and and the, one of the recipes in the 1920s that was all the rage in New York City was deviled crab. And it's pretty much similar to this. And uh, when when they would send the crab meat up there, they would send the, the shells with it so that they could pile the, the deviled crab or the imperial in that. And I remember going to so many restaurants as a kid where they would bring it out in, in the crab shell with the imperial all piled high. And I just thought that was like the coolest thing I had ever seen. Yeah, actually, my mom, I think, had some, uh, they were almost like uh, their glass. Yes. And I don't, I don't see them anymore, but yeah. they, they, that's that's what their purpose was. Yeah. For the crab imperial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they would do that. And they would be, they had them as heavy glass or ceramic. Right, and right. And it worked really nicely. But I like the real crab shell thing. So Mary, right over there, you caught some fish. I see I when you were out. Fish when I Mary, Mary was out a little <laughs> earlier, and <laughs> she what? she um, caught some. Of <laughs> You're good. You're good. One of the stars of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, we obviously we have crabs, we have oysters, but the fish that I like the most is rockfish. I and rockfish is also known as is a striped bass. But um, here we call it rockfish. And uh, there's many different stories of why we call it rockfish. Um, you know, John, I, I really don't know of those stories, yeah. but that, I've always known them as rockfish. And then, yeah. then one day someone called them striped bass. And I said, well, you know, I've never heard that term actually, but uh, rockfish is what we call them. It, I, I really don't know what that, what that uh, I know when, when I was a kid and used to fish, which I can't do much fishing. The only thing I catch when I go fishing is a cold most of the time. But, <laughs> but you always call them around rocks. And yes. I don't know if that, if that has, does that have anything to do with the rockfish? I, I think it, I think it does. One of the stories that I heard was um, from people up at Rock Hall, because like in the Cosa, there were a lot of rocks all around there. And they said that so many of these fish, the striped bass, would come in there. They could actually walk across them like rocks to get to the other side. Okay. Hence, rockfish. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that, that that's the one that we. I love. think I've heard that. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's, I'm just that's saying they're story. back and we can fish for them again because at one time they were very endangered. They were. Yeah. Yeah. They were. Yeah. Kid, yeah. They're well managed. Uh, you they know, are. the Maryland all all the species that are harvested in Maryland crabs fish. Uh, they're very well managed in a science-based uh, program uh, in conjunction with Virginia and the Potomac River Fisheries Commission. So, yeah, I mean, all this stuff's very sustainably managed, and and, uh, and we feel, all feel good about that. Yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty fortunate yes. with it. So what we're going to do, instead of just putting this into a crab shell, we're going to make, I think, the premier <laughs> dish of the entire Chesapeake Bay is a rock imperial. So how about that? Uh, yeah. You got my vote. All right, well, let's get started. <laughs> 
Okay, so to make our rock imperial, what I'm doing first and getting the skillet down, getting it nice and hot. Um, I'm gonna put a little bit of olive oil in there. You could put really any kind of oil. You could use a, a vegetable oil. Basically what I'm doing is just trying to coat the bottom of this. Uh, you can also do, you could do it with just a, like a little pan, a little metal pan, whatever is fine. But I like to do it in here because I've seen people do this a couple of different ways. You know, you have the beautiful pieces of rockfish and they'll just put that in a pan and put this on top of it and bake it. But what I find works nicer and I get a better product is I take a little bit of salt, put that on there, and then I'm going to take some cracked black pepper and put that there. And then we get this, you see, it's just about smoking hot here. So I'm going to take that mm, and put that down. Boy, I love that. And I can tell that. That rockfish skin is so beautiful. Yeah, you you did good this morning. You did. You're done right nice. Right yeah, nice. Right. Oh, good. So all we're going to do is I'm going to leave that on for about, let's say, two minutes. Mm -hmm. Just to sear the outside of the skin. And then uh, we'll flip that over. And once we flip it over, it's already going to start cooking on the other side. And then we just pile that thing high with um, our crab imperial and get it in the oven. So it's really a simple thing to do. Um, okay, so just had a couple minutes on one side. I'm gonna take this, flip it over, mm. and you can see it just That's started to cook. Mm. It's not really cooked, but you get that started. It's beautiful. It looks nice, doesn't it? That's yeah. beautiful. All right, now this is about all we need to do. We can shut that off. Mm -hmm. One of the things you could do is you could get that your fish done like that and then let it cool. Um, and then later you could put your Imperial on it when your guests are coming, just throw it right in the thing. So you can get everything ready ahead. You don't have to do this like boom, boom, boom. We could have made our Imperial early this morning right? and then it would be ready. Okay. All right, so now all I'm gonna do is just take this beautiful, and beautiful, that, beautiful. That is, that is pretty. Imperial. How could you do little tiny ones of these too, like little rockfish bites? You could. Yeah, yeah. You could. Yeah, that'd be party. fun. Cook yeah. Cook at a time, then cut up the, and do Yeah, yeah. That'd be real fun. Look, look at the peppers showing up in there. So Yeah, pretty. that's that's a nice part of it. I love that. Not only do they taste good, but it definitely looks good. Yeah. Mm. So here we go. That's this, nice. this is what we have. Now I'm going to take it. And I'm going to just put it in the oven, and then we'll make a little topping for it, okay? Well, you only used a little bit. This will serve a lot of people. Oh, absolutely. We can keep on making rock fish. I'll right? tell you what. Or, or, you know, or I know what you're having for dinner tomorrow. <laughs> there you go. All there right. You go. Okay. And then I get this in the oven. You know, we put the, the fish in. I, I cook it at about 375 degrees. It takes about 15, 20 minutes. So when I'm about, I got five minutes, eight minutes left. I make this little topping, which is just some mayonnaise, some Old Bay, um, a little lemon juice, and egg. And so I'm just going to take that mm, and that put it good. over <laughs> the bacon. <laughs> it does. So, I mean, really, it's kind of essentially turns into a little bit like a hollandaise. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it generally will puff up a little bit. So we're just going to take this back right here. Back into okay. the oven. All right. And we're going to just... Okay. Put it back in the oven. Boy, oh, doesn't that look good? That looks mm. yummy. All right, so oh here we gosh. go. Whoa. We have our finished rockfish imperial here. And it, like I was telling you, you can see how that eggy part, mm -hmm. you know. It's beautiful. Sounds up like that. that. Beautiful. So it just smells so good. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's nothing yeah. wrong with a little bit of rockfish. We can pick on that a little oh, bit. Oh, my God. That'll be good. So that's pretty much all you need. Um, you know, you can service with... Uh, scalloped potatoes or roasted red potatoes, some asparagus, whatever you like. But this is one of the best that the Chesapeake has to offer. You know, that, the gorgeous rockfish, the gorgeous crab meat from J.M. Clayton. A, and this is a winner. That's all local stuff. Very right. nice. Thank you. Beautiful. All right, let's Beautiful. eat. Oh all my right. gosh, yes. It's a shame people on, on, on the other end of these cameras can't smell or taste this. I know, you know? I know. We <laughs> haven't figured how to they, make that can, happen, they, but we're working on they it. They can if they follow the recipe. Well, that was quite the crabby little time we had there, wasn't it? Beautiful, beautiful yes. job. Well, we, we love crab.
But this is a seafood extravaganza from Maryland today, and we have to look at some of the other seafood that we have in the Bay. And this is the legendary Chesapeake oyster. Um, there were stories, books, wars fought all around these lovely bivalves um, <clears throat> from, from all around the Bay. In the olden days, they said that the, there were oyster reefs they were way up out of the water and the boats would have to circumnavigate around that. Exactly. I mean, if they didn't watch it, you'd run into one and they weren't too kind to the bottom of the boat. There's, they've got sharp shells here. They are. Uh, yeah. They so are. They would grow up in great big clumps and, and reefs. And I've seen that recreated in certain areas. People are experimenting with uh, growing and aquaculture yeah. with, with the uh, with the oysters. So, yes. isn't that fun? Yeah, and it is. And the other thing, you know, there were so many oysters in the Chesapeake back uh, when Captain John Smith first sailed into the bay, that within a, two days, they could filter the entire bay. There were so many yeah, of them. Something. Now, it's, it takes about six months to a year to filter everything from the, the oysters that we have. But we're doing all <clears> kinds <throat> of different things. Um, you know, n quite a number of organizations are working on building oyster reefs oh. and uh, repopulating the wild oysters such uh, an amazing thing with farm-raised oysters now Absolutely. all over the bay. They're all filter feeders and they all do, as you mentioned, uh, you know, to clean the water and we need that. We, the, we bay, the bay really, really does need those fil uh, yeah. filter feeders for sure. And they're good eating. <laughs> they are good eating, John. So yeah, so it's amazing, uh, you know, the variety of oysters that we have now. There's all kinds of different seeds. They all have different names and they usually have something to do, you know, like a chincoteague or, you know, a, a rock board or something like that of where it's grown. And each oyster actually has a different flavor depending on where it was grown in the bay. As you get further down towards the mouth of the bay, it's saltier. And as you get up further, it's sweeter. So. Anyway, we're really lucky that we have such a variety of oysters um, in the bay, both wild and uh, farm raised. And right. So it's, it's, it's a pretty cool thing. We're Again, we're lucky. We are fortunate. I think from what I understand, a lot of these growers and, and, and different regions, as you mentioned, John, that's like wine. They're marketing like wine. You know, the, these are these are certain oysters from a certain region and they have this flavor profile and that's how they market them. You go in restaurants and they got all these different oysters. They do. They do. And, they're, uh, they're like wine tastings. Yeah. It, you know, you go to the Grand Central Oyster Bar up in New York mm -hmm. and there's, you know, oysters from all over the world and they all have different flavors and different profiles, but you will find a lot of specific Chesapeake oysters when you're up there. Right. Absolutely. Good, good. So, all right, so if we're not eating them on a half shell, one of my favorite things is fried oysters. So I'm, we're gonna make something today that's called single fried. And you are saying, well, what does that mean? That means there's no more than one in there, right? That's right. <laughs> so I'm gonna put equal amounts of cornmeal and flour. Uh, gonna take uh, some salt, about a tablespoon for this. Also, gonna put a little bit of Old Bay in. Again, another about tablespoon of that. And about a teaspoon or so of cracked black pepper. It's a pretty simple dredging mixture. Yeah. Uh, it, this can work for anything. You could use this for catfish. You could use it for, um, you know, just about anything that you like to fry. And um, it depends, you know, if you want it hotter, put a bunch of more pepper in it. Um, if you like a little bit spicier, put some more Old Bay into it, or you could put some cayenne in with it as well. Okay. So that's not too hard, right? We got that right there. So as everyone can see, like that. Then we have something that is absolutely beautiful, shucked oysters. Um, Beautiful. Look, look, at beautiful. These. look at these. Beautiful. They're they absolutely beautiful. gorgeous. Mm. And so some people, they'll do different things. They'll double flour. They'll flour it first, then they'll put it in an egg mixture, and they'll do yada, yada, yada. I don't like it. Okay. I go for simple. You're a purist. Uh, I'm I a like purist. That. So look at all that liquid in there. Mm -hmm. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. That's oyster liquor. And oyster liquor is like one of the best things in the world. Mm. And is like, I call it Chesapeake gold. And you don't get rid of it. You save it. You can use it. It's almost like a fish stock. It's got so much flavor. How about that? Yeah. 
It's I would say it's it's the oyster's answer to your baiter. There you go. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, All right. Well, yeah. That makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. Well, it's relief. It's a lot of flavor in there. It's a lot of flavor in it. You got it. You got and, it. That is and beautiful. And whenever you put it in anything, like if we were making an oyster stew, putting that liquor in there, mm. that's what gives oh, it all the flavor. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. And I know some a lot of new recipes now are coming out with like oyster liquid as a flavoring. I guess because it's really got a great, just great texture. It, it does. It. it does. It's it's pretty that? amazing. So. Again, this is really very, very simple stuff, but it's really tasty stuff. So I'm not, I'm not doing a whole lot of pushing or mm -hmm. pegging. I'm just tossing these gently. gently oysters in there. If you want them to be a little bit thicker coated, what you could do is do like I did this right now, and you could put it on a plate and let it sit for about five minutes. Mm -hmm. Then put it back in. Oh, okay. so it'll build up. Um, it'll, yeah, and it'll build up a little bit. It'll give you a little bit more of a coating. I actually like a lighter coated oyster. Mm -hmm. I don't like it really, really, really thick. So, so you want to have some nice hot oil. Oh boy, nice. that's ready. That's ready. Whoa, Look at that. Pretty. All right. Go, John. So as yeah, you that see, beautiful. Now that was a oh fast gosh. fry, was it not? Amazing. Minute, two minutes tops. That's it. So the secret in this is having a very hot oil, not burning. You don't want smoke coming flying out of it, but you want it to be nice and hot. And you get those oysters in there. They don't absorb all the oil and they're nice and crisp beautiful. and beautiful. beautiful. And um, this is just an amazing kind of, you know, uh, dish that you can have. So you can have this as an appetizer. You could have it as your entree or let me show you something here. I just happen to have right in my... Just so happen to have just it. Just happen to have, have it. Oh, oh, look at that. This, this oh is something gosh. that people absolutely love to get a Caesar salad. Mm -hmm. And then they just put a couple of freshly fried oysters on there that are still warm. And when you cut into this with the flavor of all that garlic and cheese oh with, the, mm. with the Caesar salad, it, it's unbelievable. So, yeah, you can make an oyster pour bori out of it. Mm -hmm. You can make a fried oyster platter. Uh, you can make a little appetizer out of it, but this is a nice thing to do, and you could have this for your whole dinner. Get a, make a big salad and do that. But I think we should actually have this for our um, dinner. Would you like one? Oh, you, uh, absolutely. absolutely! Absolutely, I'm going to dip. Gonna dip? Oh, okay, I'm going to come you're on. Doing. Let's dip. Go ahead. Okay, let's dip. thank you. Mmm. Mm. Oh my gosh. Mm. That's so, amazing. So good. we really wish you were here, <laughs> all of you, but. You can actually make these in your own home. And as you saw, it's not really hard. Mm -hmm. It's really just some seasoned flour, cornmeal, into mm -hmm. some hot oil. And you have some of the best eaten oysters that you could possibly they have. They are they delicious. Are, the Chesapeake Bay oysters are so good. I don't know if I mentioned it to you, but my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and my great-uncles were all oystermen. Now, they were on the Virginia side, uh -huh. the high water side, but... Um, it's a long history, if anybody's in this area, about the oysters in our bay. It's just amazing what we have. Here. It is. It is. We are so fortunate to have all these species, mm -hmm. and the oysters got to be right at the top of the list, John. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're covering them all here today. All right, we're doing it. Well, next, you brought up a great thing. We're so lucky to have all these species. Well, we have a couple new species that we're not quite sure how we feel about. So um, we're going to take a look and, and see a little bit about this, and then we're going to figure out how we can cook our way out of it. My name is Paul Springer. I've been a commercial fisherman my whole entire life, but I've just started recently into these, these uh, blue cats in the last five or six years. It seems to me that the, uh, it's a very sustainable seafood catch. I can tell when I, was, when I was younger crabbing, the crabs were on a decline before this catfish market opened up. And now that this catfish market has opened, the crab population is starting to come back. Uh, we're doing a little something for it anyways, you know? <laughs> and that's, that was the main goal in all this is, is trying to keep them in check. Well, it seems like we've been doing that. We mainly trout line for the blue cat, but we do occasionally fish pot, and we uh, use a little bit of gill net to catch them in the winter time when it gets extremely cold. As long as the river's not frozen, we're right here fishing for them. We're catching these fish here today, and uh, They'll be up at Capital Seaboard before 12 o'clock and they'll be processing tomorrow and they'll be out to ship out to Wegmans uh, probably tomorrow, the next day. 
Uh, so they're getting a, a very fresh product. They're almost still alive when they get up the Capitol. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so, you know, Mary, you were talking about how blessed we are to have so many wonderful species of fish in the bay. And it's true, we, you know, we have been um, traditionally, but now we have some kind of like uh, new guys on the block and some of them are a little bit problematic. Uh, you know, we have- uh, You're so kind, John. Extremely. I another word. You know. <laughs> extremely problematic. Well, you know, the one that everybody, and it started about 10 years ago that everyone was so excited about was the snakehead. Because it sounds scary. Everybody was scared about it because it can swim, it can walk, it can come and get you. It takes your children's at night. It's terrible. <laughs> so, so anyway, so that was like, that, that got the top billing on the invasive species. Now, snakehead eating is very good. It's a nice, meaty uh, texture. The problem with it is it's not a great commercial fishing fish. It's not easy to get the snakehead. Um, you know, you got to... You got to go run after them. You got to shoot them, some of them with a bow and arrow. At night under dark. a light. At night, At night under a light. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's not your typical easy um, fishing kind of thing. No, it isn't. It's very difficult to find. And, and as I've heard, it's very difficult to reel in when you get one. Exactly. Yeah. So, so anyway, you're not finding a tremendous amount of snakehead on plates or, or around in commercial. So if you go to your local fishmonger, a lot of times you're not going to find any snakehead. But one of the things you will find, one of the things you will find is the blue catfish, okay? And that bad boy is taking up so much of the biomass of the bay right now, especially the rivers, tributaries down further south as we go south of the Bay Bridge, I believe. And uh, they like to eat. These, these things, mm. they eat. And they like to eat everything. They like to eat the little oysters. They like to eat the little crabs. They like to eat all the, the, the small little fish. fish. Because they can get big. They can get up 150, 160 pounds. Oh. They just destroy the habitat. And as, as you mentioned, all the, all the uh, uh, they're top of the food chain. I they are. I don't think anything's eating them out there. Not in our bay. They're not. No. And so we theoretically are the only predator that they, they can have. So we need to be able to kind of fish and eat our way with these catfish. Now, I do want to tell you one of the nice things about this catfish. Um, we have a couple native species of catfish in the bay. People are weird about catfish. They just are weird about catfish. My grandmother, everybody was weird about catfish because the, the indigenous species has a very muddy taste. Uh, my grandmother would soak it in milk overnight to get some of that muddy flavor out. Now this, this blue catfish does not have that. It does do some bottom feeding, but it swims a little bit more in the center of the bay. It's getting all kinds of uh, other, um, uh, you know, protein and plankton that it's eating. And so it has a really, let's take a look. There's, I have a, a filet here. That's a pretty piece of fish. It John. is, and it's nice. It's really firm. Kind, you know, the, the native catfish can be a little kind of gushy kind mm -hmm. of feeling, but this is nice and firm. It has a very sweet flavor. Okay. Very, very good. So if we have to have an invasive, this is a great one because it is so darn tasty. Um, one caveat to that is I was saying that they grow up to about 150, 160 pounds. Uh, you don't want to eat a big, one of those big catfish. Oh. Um, Are they tough? Well, or? it's ten, from 10, you want to use a, a fish from 10 pounds or smaller. Okay. When you, and if you have big fish, like top of the food chain, everything they're eating, they pick up a lot of toxins, a lot of mercury, PCBs. So it's not healthy to eat one of those large fish. So you want to get it. And any of your fishmongers, anybody that you go to and get it and you have the blue cat, that's what they sell. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful product. So you remember we were just recently, we did oysters, right? We did fried oysters. Well, that, that cornmeal mixture that we made with the flour be perfect for just taking and dredging that in there. Oh boy. Mm. You could even put in a little mm. buttermilk before and then put that in there and fry that up. Yeah. You could have some delicious fried catfish. But I came up with this idea and I thought, you know, I grew up in Baltimore and we ate these things called Cotties and also known in New England as codfish cakes. So they're usually made with salt cod. 
Soft cod was a preservation technique uh, because, you know, the cod industry was massive, mm. massive, and people didn't have refrigeration. So, Mary, can you show us, help us sure. do this thing here? Yeah. All right. So to make salt cod, what they do is they pack it in coarse salt. That's all it is to it. So I thought, well, we have all this dang catfish around here. Could we make salt cod? So I packed some fillets a couple of days ago in there. And look what we have. Wow. Starting to get like cardboard, look at um, that. just like a salt cod, a piece of salt cod. I think they call that in Italian, what, bacala? Yes, they do. Yes, and many dishes are fashioned out of that particular salt cod. Well, we can do the exact same thing here with our salt cat. So that's all I did. I packed it in it and I leave it in there for three, four, five days. The only thing you want to do every day, take it out. And if there's any moisture, just drain it out, put a little more salt in. And uh, there you go. That's beautiful. Yeah. beautiful. Now, you can imagine if we ate this right now, we're going to get our sodium content for probably in the next six to 12 months. We don't want- <laughs> it is want... kosher salt. It is kosher salt. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take it and put it in water. Oh. And the best thing to do is- um, You're rinsing it. You're going to rinse it. And you're going to keep mm. rinsing it um, actually for hours. And what I would probably do after an hour, I'd take this water out, replace it, put some more fresh water in, and you keep doing it. So you're, it's kind of like, you know, when you freeze dry anything and you reconstitute it, we're reconstituting the cod. You need to do this and keep it in the refrigerator for those hours? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so that's what we would be doing with that. So we're <laughs> going to let that sit there and, and rest a little bit. Now, again, most any kind of codfish cake, salmon cake, bluefish cake, whatever you have, is really just grandma's recipe to stretch that protein. Or you had it left over from the night before, right? Okay. So let's say we had a nice um, piece, a couple pieces of the blue cat over. Maybe she, uh, she cooked it, she baked it or something like that. She had some of that left over. So you take in some just potatoes, boiled potatoes. And remember, when you boil your potatoes, Put some salt in the water. Otherwise, your potatoes will have absolutely no taste at all. Mm. Not a lot, but if you don't have any in it, you're going to say, ah, this dish is flat. That's so don't pasta cooking. Yeah, mm -hmm. same thing with same pasta. Thing. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do first, we're going to flavor this. It's our kind of, we're making mashed potatoes. So I'm going to put some eggs in here. Um, I actually have, where's our sauteed onions? Oh, Mary's got the sauteed onions. So we have a nice big onion, sauteed that. Put that in there. Oh, that looks good. Done it. And I'll give that to you. you. Then I have some dill. Um, this is a dry dill. So whenever you're using a dried versus fresh, if you're using dried, use half the amount of fresh. Okay. Because when you dry things, kind of like when we did our catfish, it concentrates the flavor. So you have to be very judicious with your dried herbs. Okay. How about that? Okay. Wow. Now we got some chives. These were right out of Gertie's Gardens out back in the restaurant. <laughs> and then we have some flat leaf parsley that we're going to put in here. Mm -hmm. And then let's see what else we have here. We can get it, put in our thing here. We got the chives, the parsley and stuff like that. I'm going to put in you know, you know how I am. I just, I just like a, a little bit of Worcestershire sauce. Why not? Huh? Why not? And I'm going to put a little bit of Tabasco in here, like a so. And I also like to use just a little bit of Old Bay because I do. And it's what I like. And so I'll do it. So I'll put a little, just a little bit. I don't want it to have, you know, too much of a flavor. But it just gives it, just gives it a little a bit little. extra. So anyway. It gives it a little sophistication. It does. And we all need a little sophistication in our life. Yeah, we do. All right. So now it's time to get the fish in here. Okay. So I'm just going to take some catfish. I usually use either a ratio of, like if I'm using two pounds of potatoes, I probably use about two pounds of fish. Okay. Now okay. I may not use two pounds of salt cat. I might use like, um, let's say about a pound of salt cat and mix it with the fresh. Okay. 
that way you're not getting too much. So I'll just, I'll just, you know, you could just put a little of this in mm -hmm. there and then you're good to go. Okay. So anyway, so that's about all we have to do. Now we can just kind of mash it up a little bit like so and get the potatoes. This is another thing that you can make way in advance. Right. You know, make this, you can have it ready for tomorrow and you know what you're gonna have for dinner. So really, like Alice Waters and Chez Panisse out in California, mm -hmm. she said the best mixing tools that there is in the entire world is your hands. How about that? Just yeah. wash them and use them. <laughs> when you're tossing a salad, it's a great thing because you can feel how much dressing you're putting on. You put a little bit at a time. Your hands tell you a whole lot of things. Makes sense. So there you go. So anyway, so we have a nice big cat, catty mixture here. And what I'm gonna do is we're gonna take that and put it into the refrigerator, right? Okay. So we put that big batch of caddies into the refrigerator. I like it to sit overnight. That way it gets a little tighter, easier to work with. And then we're ready to cook. Um, what do you have here? It's mashed potatoes, right? It's really mashed potatoes with some fish. So we're just reheating it through. You could bake them, you know, spray it with a little, okay. nice. or brush them with some butter, put them in the so oven. Sounds like fun. Or you can saute them, you could deep fry them, you could do whatever you want to do with it. So we'll just put some of those in here. And that's really what we're doing is just heat, heating them all through. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not doing... The fish is already cooked. Right? Yeah, the fish yeah. is cooked already. So we're not doing a lot of cooking. We're just kind of frying and browning the things off. Making that looks look good. good that yummy. looks real good. That's good. It smells yeah. great, too. It does. Yeah. Okay, just put that in there and let these, let these guys... So, uh, stupid question. They stay together because the potatoes, the starch, it holds them together. Exactly. That, okay. And, and the you tell a lot of many times in the kitchen. Well, that's all right. What I eat. Well, that's why we're doing a class. <laughs> okay. I will watch it. All right. All right. We're going to let these cook for just a couple minutes okay. now. Okay. Now, is there any particular kind of wool you recommend, John? You I may use, have already covered it. But. I usually use, like, just a vegetable oil. It could be a canola oil. Okay. Um, you wouldn't want to use a um, olive oil in this because it has a low burning temperature. I see. And they get all smoky and burn on you. Okay. But just, you know, any kind of good vegetable oil is, is great for this. Oh, they're pretty. Look they how brown they are. I mean, you know... It's a fish cake. Really, it's just a fish cake. Or a potato cake. Or a potato cake or you whatever. Trick your kids. Potato that, cake. Yeah. There you go. That's yeah, you right. can trick them. Yeah. yeah, you can trick them. Say, oh, look, we got a, we got potato, a potato cake. Potato cakes. Here you go. Enjoy. Get, and who doesn't, like, who doesn't like a potato cake? Exactly. I've exactly. never seen anybody. Do that. No. So, Jack, with the, with the blue catfish, how is that? Is it a impacting the crab population at all? Well, you know, it, it, it having a tremendous impact on, on the crab population and that, you know, since Hurricane Agnes in 72, we lost so much habitat. Right. The bay grass has almost died off 100%. And they've, they've recovered greatly, but nowhere near what they were at a level before, before that storm. Right. And so, you know, anything that's out there, these cats, they can see it. I mean, everybody eat it. And you know, as you wow. mentioned, they get big. I mean, how big are the mountains on these things? I mean, they're massive. They're, they're, I mean, 160 pounder. That's yeah, the mouth I mean, huge. Want to put your fist in one? I mean, yeah. whole crabs. They, they can, you know, adult crabs. They can. They're going to eat them. You know, yeah, they are. And I understand their jaws are unique too. Um, oh, are they? Yeah, I understand their jaws. So it's harder to catch them. That's why you have to use the uh, the shocker. Uh, yeah. How about that? Deep bow and arrow. Well, get them any way you can, and don't throw them back. No. When you get one, don't so throw it back. what do they do with the large ones when they do find them since you can't eat them? Can they, are they any useful purposes in there? Well, you know, you would hope at some point that they could be something that could be used as some sort of fertilizer yeah, or something. Or something. something has some value somewhere. Yeah. And probably, probably already do, but uh, I'm not aware. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what that is. Okay, the librarian here will have to research All right, you're okay. 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 I'll have to research All right. That. So there you go. We just... We just oh, cook these beautiful. up here like oh, that. Oh my, they're gorgeous. Oh my gosh, Look they're at that. John. 
So we get those. There are a lot more. We're going to let we're going to let those we're going to let those cool down just a little bit because mm -hmm. I think it could be too much for our mouths to bear. <laughs> That's it too. But we have crackers. We have served. crackers. So this is this is a great thing to do with it. You, you would do these with cotties as well. You can make these nice and small or whatever, and you just put one on a cracker yeah. and then. Mary also has a delicious three mustard sauce there that she loves so much. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's this is the that's, that's this a, is a, a tartar sauce. Gotcha. But I suggest with Ooh. these just a little bit oh of a three mustard sauce, and uh, that's this is some really good eating. Now again, you know we're doing this as a little appetizer, but you can make these things. You know we could turn these things into nice big size things, mm -hmm. and it's your dinner. Um, how they would do that in New England is they'd have some baked beans with the fish cakes, and uh, and you you got the perfect meal. Oh, I'd say. Yeah, and that is perfect. Yeah, so that's beautiful. So what are these about uh, two ounces a piece? Yeah, about two ounces mm -hmm. a piece. Yeah, beautiful. Hey, that's a beautiful presentation. Now tell me about the, the the sauce here. Is that something you mixed up or? Is yeah, that yeah, it? yeah. So it um, basically has three different kinds of mustard: a yellow mustard, a grain mustard. Um, uh, and another um, double grain, a thicker grain mustard. Perfect. So we use um, three of those in there and then put a little bit more, you know, hot sauce and so forth. But it works really nice with seafood and uh, I use that a lot. Right. So again, just these are just some ideas of what we can do, you know, with these invasives, how we mm -hmm. can kind of eat our way out of this problematic and eat our way out deliciously, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Uh, beautiful. So even though we have a new, some new visitors into our, um, into our bay, we can continue this celebration, you know, of, of the best that Maryland has to offer. Um, one of the places that you can look at is Maryland's best Dot net great resource for everything that's local everything that's maryland uh maryland's best seafood another great site for you to check out it tells you when things are in season where you can find them um, and the important part is that we know that that we have that in our heads and we're able to get out there and shop and buy all this amazing product that people really work very hard Jack, you're one of those guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it takes a lot of effort to get these from the water and in whatever form they are presented in to you. So yeah, exactly, it's, it's, it's to be appreciated. For sure. It is to be appreciated. And there are many different choices that consumers have of what type of products to get. Right. And so when you make that decision to buy things that are from Maryland or from the Chesapeake region, not only you're getting the best food that you could possibly get, but you're keeping that money in our communities to build them and make them stronger. And it helps us to rebuild our local food economy. Absolutely. And, and so when I'm telling you, get you to this farmer's market, get you to your ye, to your local fishmonger, <laughs> and then we can have everything that we would need here. We got our crabs, we got our oysters, we got everything. But the last thing that we Okay, well, we've had some of we've we've made some of the best seafood oh that you can God. get in Maryland, correct? Correct. Beautiful. Well, we had to have beer to go with it because I, when I grew up, we had beer with all of our seafood. And you know, there's so many different breweries and, and craft breweries throughout the Maryland region and the Chesapeake region now. They're doing amazing, amazing work. And again, it's it's another thing that's boosting our local economy. But um, I do have to tell you that there's one that's near and dear to my heart because as you know, Mary, I spend a lot of time in Ireland. I'm usually in Ireland every year. That's where my peoples are from. And um, so I, I think I was born with some Guinness in my hand. And it's an amazing thing that Guinness Brewery opened a, um, a brewery in Baltimore. It's the only operation that they have in the United States. Amazing. Very close to, um, in, in to, in to the airport here, um, you know. And so anyway, it's called Open Gate Brewery um, by Guinness. And those guys, they make some of the best beer that I that I've ever tasted. And they came up with this this great. It's called Baltimore Blonde, and it's distinctly number one. It's made in Baltimore. Number two, it was crafted to go very well 
with seafood. It has mm -hmm. some citrus notes and highlights and it's very light and, and, and tasty. And so not only does it taste good, but Guinness here in, in Baltimore is doing amazing things. They're raising so much money for charities, supporting the local economy, and they employ hundreds of people locally. So if you haven't been over there to check it out, it is so cool. They have music outside. It, it, it is more fun. It's almost as fun as the one in Dublin, but they're getting close. So anyway, I think, come on, Mayor, let's, we're going to, we got to get, we got to get started here. So we're going to have some, some Baltimore blonde. That looks good. Yours. Right, thank you. Here you go. You want to keep All going right, on that sure. one? Sure. All right. All right. So we got that. We're going to have a little bit of caddies for lunch here, along with our rockfish imperial. So, oh my God. so life is good. So cheers. 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 cheers and cheers everyone. to you. And thanks to all of you for joining us here in season one at, um, you know, our, our farm and bay to table. Um, in coordination with the Harford County Public Library. Um, we work with um, the Maryland Department of Agriculture, Maryland Department of Seafood, and everybody who's helped. We have an amazing team of people who have helped us on this project um, over, over these past months. And we've had a, a lot of fun doing it. And we hope you've had fun too. So we're putting our heads together coming up with scathingly brilliant ideas, deliciously brilliant ideas for season two. And we're looking forward to seeing you then. So until then, cheers, cheers. from all of us here at Farm and Bay to Table. Cheers. Yeah, thanks so much Thank for you. being here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. This has been great Thank fun. Thank Thank see you guys. Bye. 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 Thank you. Okay, we're on our second beer here. So I think it's time <laughs> that we do some Q&A. So you've all been watching and I'm sure, you know, with seafood, People are a little nervous about cooking seafood sometimes, so we can answer your questions. So just let us have it and uh, we'll do our best to answer everything we can. Right? Right. All right. Go. Well, John, okay. The oysters are amazing and I want <laughs> it was so much fun. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the Guinness, you can't beat the Guinness and the and Baltimore Blonde, just saying, you know. So anyway, we do have a few questions. So one of the first questions, which I thought you touched a little bit on, was what are some of the best places or to buy fresh seafood in, in this area, um, especially in the Columbia area, perhaps, um, and uh, especially if it's in season? And you mentioned a couple websites. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a number of different websites that we can find out where things are in season. Obviously, you know, MarylandsBest.net and Maryland's Best Seafood. Um, so there, you know, there, there, there's a number of larger uh, places uh, like Wegmans uh, um, throughout the region. They take a lot of care to work with, um, you know, local crab, crab people and watermen and uh, so, you know, different fishmongers and different fish markets, uh, Cross Street Market down in Baltimore, you can find things there. Uh, you could take a drive down to Cambridge and go to J.M. Clayton's. Uh, yeah. And um, so, yeah, so there's, there's quite a number of different markets, but you have to call. You have to know uh, who your fishmonger is. And uh, yeah. And so, you know. Just get out there and start talking because they're like, like we said, there's not a tremendous amount of Maryland crab, you know, there, you know, uh, there, there's just certain places that you can get it. And, um, you know, maybe what we can do is we'll get some resources because I know a number of other places and we can put that up so people can come and look at it and get some, get some, you know, good ideas for that. That's a, that's a great idea. So here's another interesting question too. How, what would you recommend for someone who traditionally dislikes seafood and they want to try to change their mind about it? What would you, what would you recommend they try or to taste or to sample? I'd go start with a crab dip um, because, you know, it's a really, really creamy thing. It generally has some mayonnaise in it. Um, uh, some cream cheese that is whipped up, has a lot of spices in it, 
good bit of cheddar cheese, and it happens to have some crab. So if you get, you know, get that with a baguette and um, put that all over top of it, uh, you're going to start liking seafood, I promise you. Um, another thing that a lot of people find as a good entryway into that are shrimp. Um, you know, uh, golf caught shrimp. We use at the restaurant wild caught shrimp. Uh, all comes from the Gulf of Mexico. And so that's a good way to get into it because it's not, a lot of people say something's too fishy. Um, yeah, so so I would try that crab dip. And I think you're gonna, you know, I think people who are on the fence about it, they're gonna come to our side. Oh my God, that, that is so true. And I think that's how all of us start in the beginning is the crab dip, it's the shrimp. And yeah. then we just keep going. All right. So now we have a couple questions about the oysters uh, that you prepared. So the oil yeah. we used, I believe you said, was a good quality vegetable oil. Um, and then yeah. also it was. OK. And then the other uh, suggestion was, can you make these that don't live in, in an air fryer? Now, that's a good question. Um, I use canola oil generally. It has a good burn temperature. You can get it pretty hot. And if you think back about what we did in that, that integral part was having the oil extremely hot. That is going to seal the oyster, make it nice and crispy, and it'll keep all that beautiful oyster liquor inside. So when you bite into it, it's nice and juicy and, and wonderful. Now, in the air fryer, I'm not quite sure that we would get the temperature that we would get and the same reaction that we would get with the thing. I do believe it probably would be quite tasty, but I don't think you're going to get exactly that same crispiness and bite that you would get with doing it in oil. However, Mary, as you and I know, we are working on our air fryer show that will eventually air. It could be a special. It may be a three or four hour special. And we can probably try um, air frying an oyster live, live. You, you always get my support to do that with oysters. That sounds wonderful. And one other thing that just came to, you know, my mind, you know, things come, Conrad's. Conrad's crabs, unbelievable. You know, they, they have, the, I, they're my favorite steamed crab to get, but also it's a fantastic resource for fresh crab meat. And almost all of their crab meat comes from J.M. Clayton in Cambridge. So I know that there's one up in Harford County, there's one in Baltimore County and Parkville. Um, so that's another good resource, at least for our area, but all over the state, you know, people just need to, to ask their local fishmonger, and I'm sure they can get them local crab meat. That's awesome. That's really great. So a couple questions about recipes. Yes, recipes, we've been posting them tonight in the chat, and also they will be available below the recording as of tomorrow, and the, the uh, recording for this will be available until the end of this calendar year, which is exciting. And the question was the salting recipe. We talked about using the kosher, the coarse kosher salt for the fish, will we be making that available? Oh, the recipe for that? Actually, that recipe is in the context of the caddies. Awesome. So when they, for the caddies, when they get the caddy recipe, at the bottom, it is a note, and it tells how you can make your own salt cat. Okay. All right. And here's a question about the oil. A lot of good oil questions tonight. Can you use avocado oil? Now that's that's a good that's a good question. Um, I think it would give it really really good flavor, but similar to olive oil, avocado oil can't tolerate a really really high heat like that heat that we need. Um, sometimes, if I want to get some flavor into an oil, is I'll take something like a canola oil heat it, get some heat going on there. And then I could add some avocado oil to that oil, basically to flavor it. Um, so I'm not using entirely that oil. And so it's not gonna burn up on you. Wow, okay. I know oil can be complicated sometimes to us novices out there. 
Yeah, it can be. I mean, it can be a little bit tricky. So uh, you have you have to be careful. And you know, we've we've talked about it in a number of our shows, especially about um, the extra virgin olive oil. There's so much solids in there. It's such a rich um, oil that it it's lovely on lettuce. But if you try to take it up, and make French fries in it, it's like, oh, that oil's going to burn up on you. All right. Well, John, we have another question. Is there any truth to the old saying that we would hear back in the older days when, when you and I were both little um, about you only ate oysters during months that had, I believe, R's in them? Is that a true statement? And do you know the source of that? Sure. That, that's a, there's some truth to it and there's some fiction to it. Um, traditionally, you know, at least in the United States and in, in our region, most of the watermen that we knew, um, their families came from Europe. And in Europe, during the summer, they would have a red tide. Um, and there was all kinds of bacteria and microorganisms in there that would get into shellfish and they became toxic. People could die from it. It happened to have, would take place in the summer, in the warm months. So they, they came up with a thing that you only harvested in the cooler months and, and you know they happened to have the letter R in there. So it wasn't exactly the same thing here over, you know, over in the States, but one thing that was very true, and I think that they went in a good direction with it, is there was no refrigeration. The, wa the waters, when the watermen were harvesting oysters in the summer, the water was warm already. And then they're taking it and putting those oysters on boats for like a day or so, they're not refrigerated, and then they're shipped. And so there was a great chance of bacteria forming uh, because of that long period of time. And the other thing is in the warmer months, that's when the oysters spawn, the wild oysters, they spawn then, and uh, they become really kind of stringy. So they're not optimal for eating anyway. However, come to the rescue, farm-raised oysters. Um, the way that the farm-raised oysters happen, um, they can immediately be taken from the water, put into refrigeration. Um, they, they are asexual. So these oysters are bred, they don't reproduce. And so you don't, they don't go through that spawning stage. So they take, take, you know, they keep nice and plump through the entire year. So it's so cool now because we can get oysters, real Chesapeake oysters year round. Um, obviously we're getting into the cooler months and so I'll, I'll be going for some wild caught, but I also pair them hand in hand with the farm race. So we're pretty fortunate here with all the variety that we have. Gosh, we are so that is so true. Well, John, I think we have time for one more question, and this goes back to our caddies. The potatoes. Do you recommend a certain type of potato? Um, I mean, I like. Well, I mean, I, obviously, I like Idaho potatoes, um, but I also like the larger Yukon Gold. Um, I like them often for mashing. They have a really they are gold, they have a beautiful texture, um, and they don't get too mushy. So I, I like using those, and I've used those with the caddies before, and, uh, and, and, and you're pretty good. The one thing to think about with, with the potatoes when you're doing it, you just don't want to overcook them, because when you overcook them, then they, they take on too much water, they become really mushy, and it doesn't work so well. It dilutes the flavor of the caddy. So a number of ways that you could circumvent that, you could steam the potato. That way it's never absorbing too much water. Or as they do in Ireland, when I'm there, uh, I always notice they don't peel them and cut them. They cook them whole in salted water until a knife pierces through it. Then you take it out, and as soon as you can handle it, the peel comes off really easily, and they're nice and dry and fluffy. 
so they don't get heavy and wet, like when we take them and peel them and cut them into little pieces to get them to cook real quick. So that's another good idea and a good tip for having a real um, solid, nice tasting caddy or mashed potatoes. Can't go wrong with mashed potatoes. That's so true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just want to thank John, of course, everything that you've done this season uh, for all the episodes and, and the team that's been behind creating all these episodes. And it really does take a village, uh, no pun intended. It takes a lot of work and we have had so much fun doing this. We are in pre-production for season two. So hopefully that will be launching soon. So stay tuned for that. Lots of surprises being planned. And um, John, do you any parting words? Just that I've had so much fun and I've had so much fun with you, Mary, as executive sous chef here, um, you know, with our, with, with our farm and bay to table kitchen. It really has been a blast. And it's, it's really been a privilege to be able to get out and talk to virtually to so many people to spread the joy and the excitement of our local food economy. So uh, I, we just keep out there and we'll keep cheerleading, Mary, you and I, we're gonna get out there and give it help. And, and the great part, anywhere you live in Maryland, you have farmer's markets, you have winter farmer markets, you have local grocery stores, you have fishmongers, you have all this that we've been talking about right at your fingertips. So um, enjoy and, and we will see you soon. Thank you, everyone, and be safe. Uh, take care.